good to see you all uh, at uh, this Onward event at Conservative Party Conference. Uh, this was uh, our most oversubscribed event uh, at this year's Pastor Conference, which is testament to the calibre of our speaker today. Uh, and that was before his turn on the media uh, this morning. Um, my name is Will Hanna. I am the director of Onward. For those of you who don't know us, we are a centre-right think tank focused on levelling up opportunity and strengthening social fabric in every corner of this country, particularly in those places where uh, social fabric and opportunity have been in scarce supply over recent decades. Um, and I am completely thrilled uh, today to have with us uh, not just uh, one of the great reforming cabinet ministers of the last decade, um, but also a great friend and supporter of Onwards, the person who actually gave the speech at our launch party uh, four years ago, Michael Gove. Now, Michael needs no introduction. Um, uh, he uh, is a formidable politician with a uh, long-standing reputation. But just to rehearse the various things that he has been doing since, uh, well, at least since 2010, um, he uh, was, of course, Education Secretary. Uh, following that, he uh, became Chief Whip. Uh, he um, was uh, Environment Secretary. Uh, he has been a just, just Justice Secretary. Uh, he has been uh, a Minister of State at the Cabinet Office, uh, or Minister for the Cabinet Office, I should say, and uh, Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster. And most recently, he has been the Secretary of State for levelling up housing and communities. So um, someone who has been in almost continuous service over the last uh, 12 years or so uh, in the Cabinet, and someone who now finds himself, uh, probably somewhat unusually, on the back benches. So I wanted to kick off uh, mm. today's discussion by asking Michael, how does it feel? Do you feel liberated? Do you uh, feel listless? What, how does it feel? More liberated than listless, yes. I mean, again, um, I left government just before the Conservative leadership election. And during the Conservative leadership election, every MP was to a greater or lesser extent and involved in a debate about the future of the party. Mm. Um, and then, obviously, we, we had a period where Liz, having won, took over as Prime Minister. And then within days, we had the, the tragic death of Her Majesty the Queen. So, uh, again, uh, politics has only really sort of restarted in the mm. course of the last week to ten days. Mm -hmm. um, and it seems odd coming into a Conservative Party conference, as you say, having been on the front bench and spoken as a minister or shadow minister here, to be here as a backbencher. But obviously we're at a time when uh, the debate about the future of the country uh, is intense for all the reasons that everyone in this room understands, because uh, we're living through very challenging times. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't need to list all of the challenges that this country and other Western democracies face. And by dint of being a backbencher, um, I have an opportunity to try to uh, make sure that some of, the, some of the arguments that we were trying to make in the Boris Johnson government mm -hmm. continue to be made. Mm -hmm. Because I think um, the 2019 election victory wasn't just a personal triumph for Boris. It was also a moment when a political realignment that had been occurring for some time yes. uh, finally took uh, its most vivid and concrete form. And uh, behind the political result in 2019 stood social and economic changes, which I think it's really important that whoever is in government properly understands if they're going to govern the country well. Mm -hmm. And so is it your view that some of those social and economic changes are not currently understood? Or, yeah. It, well, I, th I think, again, Different people will have um, their explanations for what happened in 2019 politically mm. and, and, and what has happened since. Uh, and I'm sure there'll be an ongoing debate about the, um, uh, the reasons for that. And of course, there were some reasons that were contingent and specific to that election. Mm -hmm. Jeremy Corbyn's manifest unfitness for government, the way in which um, Parliament was seen to have frustrated the previously mm. uh, clear view of the British people that we should uh, get Brexit done. Yeah. But behind that, uh, we had, first of all, in the Brexit vote itself, and then actually in the 2017 election, but masked by Corbyn's apparent success, um, a change in the country. And that change in voting patterns reflected deep underlying concerns about the way the country was run uh, and the priorities that we had. And in a sense, the, the new voting coalition that the Conservatives assembled um, of course, it had people who were uh, traditional Conservatives in every way, but it had people who voted Conservative for the first time because mm -hmm. they believed that, that Boris and the team got it. That they knew that a model of economic growth, which was based on uh, 
financial services, the strength of the city, uh, the admittedly amazing um, innovation that existed within the Oxford, Cambridge, London Triangle. That was great, mm. but it wasn't enough, quite the opposite. Um, and that even though phrases like globalization are unlikely to be um, on the lips of anyone in, in Bishop Auckland um, or in Birmingham, what they did understand is that uh, economic and social change had meant that those who had advantages and connections were doing well, that's great. Mm. You don't want to dampen you know, the innovative energy of our society. But there were communities that had been suffering and were at risk of being further left behind. And the Brexit vote was both a way of yanking the chains of politicians um, uh, and getting their attention and saying, uh, we want a, a, a political economy that listens to us. Um, and it was also, for the Conservatives, I think, a useful and healthy thing to have as our base people who were on average or below average incomes. Mm. Because it meant that you know, the one nation phrase, which has been interpreted in many ways, mm. became a reality, that we were a political party that was a national party mm. and that we were being true to our best selves and that we were having to think about a national community. Mm. Um, and uh, that, I think, is a really important thing to remember for, for whoever happens to be in government. There are some people who would say that um, actually in 2016, mm. uh, the prospectus that politicians were pursuing was what's been kind of colloquially called mm. Singapore on Thames. Yes. And, that, and that actually uh, the whole point of Brexit was mm. to diverge and yes. to uh, to deregulate, to mm. reduce taxes, to do some of the things the government is currently mm. pursuing, um, and to mark out a distinctly British mm. uh, um, uh, kind of liberal agenda within mm. the, on the on the world stage. Um, is it is it is it your view that that simply wasn't what was put across in 2016, or is there some truth in that? Um, I, I do think that was the truth of of, of the victory. Um, and again, we can argue about the detail of, of what actually happens in Singapore because there are some things about yeah. Singapore where there are, there are not the neoliberal you know, view of, uh, of how politics should operate or how an economy should be run. But I know exactly what you mean. It became a handy shorthand for yeah. um, a, a comprehensive program of deregulation and trying to make uh, uh, you know, the, uh, Britain and the UK uh, a uh, deregulated and... Um, ultra-economically liberal economy. Mm -hmm. um, and the first thing to say is that there's not what the majority of people who voted to leave voted for. The majority of people voted to, to take back control. They wanted decisions taken by people who were directly accountable to them. Mm -hmm. But it was also the case that um, some of the things that uh, had characterized our growth model in, uh, in the years up to 2016, uh, people found um, were not responsive. Mm -hmm to uh, uh, their, their needs, wishes, and hopes. So, and I do want to caricature what was happening before 2016 because there was a lot that was good that happened in the coalition government. But uh, there were concerns about um, migration, not the concerns that are often attributed to, uh, uh, to, uh, to people by those who want to demonize Brexit voters, but there were concerns that a model, uh, an economic model that had relied on a significant number of low-wage people coming, being imported into the economy, um, that economic model didn't improve productivity, but also depressed wages for those in the, in the, in the sort of bottom half of the, mm -hmm. of, of the income scale. Um, and uh, skilled workers would find that their competitive position in, in the market, people, you know, artisans, people who work with their hands, people who, who contribute uh, to the bedrock of economic growth, felt that that wasn't working in their mm -hmm. interests. More broadly, uh, there was a concern that, uh, which I think is completely understandable, that um, too much, too many uh, bets were being placed on uh, the black of the city, mm -hmm. um, uh, and not enough on making sure that other productive parts of the economy were being invested in. And there's an apocryphal story um, about uh, uh, one of the Remain campaigners campaigning, I think, in Sunderland, okay. explaining to the workers in Nissan that if we left the uh, uh, European Union, there would be a hit to GDP. And one of the workers on the shop floor saying, your GDP, not our GDP. Yes. Um, and, and again, I think that, that uh, it is, uh, if we look back at the campaign, mm -hmm. it was a campaign built, first of all, on democracy. Mm -hmm. Secondly, on 
um, making sure that resources were spent on the critical public services that people believed in, on the NHS and education. Yeah. And it was also an argument for investment in the long-term drivers of productivity. So the vote leave argument was that it needed to be science and technology and that it also needed to be the case that we needed to have, for want of a better word, an industrial strategy yes. for a new United Kingdom. Yes. We did argue that um, outside the European Union we could uh, regulate as appropriate and also that we could um, uh, strike new trade deals as appropriate. But those were um, uh, uh, minor chords in the overall argument. And I think it's important again to stress that we um, pointed out that we, we would not and should not pursue um, a reduction in environmental protections or an erosion of workers' rights. Yep. And also, uh, the argument on uh, trade was couched just as much in terms of uh, having a trade policy in the UK's interests overall uh, as anything else. Uh, it was less about um, a pure you know, David Ricardo model. It was more about using all of the levers available to a sovereign country mm -hmm. to help all its citizens. Mm. So taking all of that mm. and what you've said about the arguments made in 2019 and the mm. coalition that the Conservatives assembled. This yes. is fantastic mm -hmm. 80 seat majority coalition, mm. as you say, representing far more of the country than the Conservative mm. Party represented for a long time. Um, do you think that this government can succeed in taking its current uh, agenda and turning that into an electoral majority? Um, well, I think, I think there are challenges mm. because I think that. Um, uh, uh, if we listen to, I don't want. I'll talk about the government in just a second. But, but mm. as a preface to that, there are uh, there's a there's a broader set of um, uh, voices, powerful and coherent and intellectually confident voices on what you might call the centre right, that um, uh, uh, take the proposition mm -hmm. that uh, the the point, the purpose, the uh, motivation for Brexit mm. was uh, deregulation at all costs. Um, uh, a, uh, a, an agenda on trade which is about reducing all barriers um, and, uh, you know, essentially um, uh, uh, that argument, while it has, you know, a certain coherence and you, you, you see thinkers like Friedrich Hayek being uh, cited in, in, in defence of that, um, A, I don't think that is truly conservative. Again, I think that it is uh, an interesting and important point of the... Mm -hmm. You know, in the in the range of voices that you have in the conservative family, mm -hmm. but it's not, I don't think, the uh, and should not be the the dominant one. Um, I think, again, to be fair, there are a range of voices around the cabinet table, um, and there's also a a pragmatism mm -hmm. in the way in which the prime minister has operated in all of the ministerial roles that she's had. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, my uh, my hope would be that. Uh, we would see um, you know, an acknowledgement of the, the absolutely important part that um, uh, the economic uh, ultra-liberal argument has to play in the, in the conservative family, but we shouldn't allow that to become the, uh, you know, the, the, the dominant uh, uh, melody drowning mm -hmm. um, other things out. Mm -hmm. um, and there is a challenge for us because, as you know, and as I, I suspect other people in the room know, um, I, I was worried about two aspects of the budget. Um, uh, one was uh, that the drive for tax cuts, mm. I can completely understand, but I, I worry that it's not in the best conservative traditions to have tax cuts on this scale mm -hmm. funded by borrowing. Yes. And we might want to see more about that. And the second thing also is that the, the, the reduction in the top rate of tax, mm. I think, is a mistake as well. Um, and I think it's a particular mistake because... Um, going back to what we were talking about with One Nation and a national community, people need to feel and need to see mm. um, that uh, uh, when we are making the case for tax cuts, that the people who benefit first are those who are uh, those who have least. Mm -hmm. So uh, you know, I, I, I think there were some dangers there, but again, uh, there is an opportunity for us to have that, that conversation about what Liz and her team should be doing over the next two years. And I think it's also the case that if you listen to some of the things that uh, Simon Clark, the new levelling up secretary, has been saying, it's clear that he absolutely understands and gets the need to have um, uh, uh, an economic and uh, policy message that, that 
that recognizes that um, mm -hmm. uh, you need to encompass all of the, you know, the, the, uh, the lessons of 2019. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to come on to leveling up, actually, mm. because it, this was uh, obviously your most recent department. Mm. You actually went in the department for a, actually very long, kind of no, nine, no, ten no, no, months. No. Um, yeah. Um, but you did an enormous amount in that time. You published a 360-page white yeah. paper and, uh, and mm. brought forward the Leveling Up and Regeneration mm. Bill. Um, how concerned are you that your vision for mm. Leveling Up um, might change dramatically to the point of no longer being yeah. what you yeah, view yeah. as Leveling Up in, mm -hmm. the, in the coming months? And yes. Months? Well, again, um, everyone has to acknowledge their um, faults, mistakes, and weaknesses. I think that one of the things about the leveling up white paper, if, if self-criticism first and then defense. Mm. Uh, by way of self-criticism, I think that we didn't um, explain properly that what we were seeking to do was to uh, create the ground to irrigate uh, the soil so that the private sector could play its part in, in generating growth. Mm. Uh, and there were some critics, um, mainly on the, you know, there were some critics on the left who said, oh, you need to spend much more money. Right? And there were some critics on the right who said, this is, this is too interventionist. Yes. To those critics on the right, my, my argument would be that governments have to intervene to create the circumstances in which growth can take place. And it's not about ministers telling the private sector mm -hmm. uh, where to put capital or where to locate their businesses. It's about using the tools that we have in order to make it more attractive. Mm -hmm. um, and those, those tools will inevitably be <coughs> infrastructure spending, mm -hmm. strengthening local decision making, um, and also recognizing that there needs to be um, a policy on, uh, uh, on education, a policy on uh, further and higher education that recognizes um, where um, uh, there is talent but not yet the uh, institutions or the opportunities to make the most of it. Mm. And in that white paper, we argued that um, there was no single tool. Mm -hmm that uh, you needed to um, operate in, in a variety of different areas. And we, we used phrases which were probably a little bit too, you know, fancy pantsy, like Medici model and, you know, five capitals and so on. Mm -hmm. But behind it was a serious argument that um, the Prime Minister wanted um, uh, me to prosecute, that uh, to show you were serious mm -hmm. over the long term, there was a lot that you had to do, mm -hmm. everything from making sure that the public uh, square in places that have been overlooked was enhanced. Mm -hmm. um, and that includes everything from uh, some investment in making sure that city and town centers are more attractive. It also includes tackling antisocial behavior. You need to do all of these things, mm -hmm. experience tells us, to transform opportunity. Now, again, my, uh, uh, one of the things that makes me optimistic is the government's ambition when they're talking about opportunity zones seems designed to show that they uh, recognize that there are a range of tools that you need to deploy in mm -hmm. areas that have fallen behind to generate economic growth. My gentle worry at this stage is that there seems to be an emphasis more on some interventions and not the full suite. Yep. But again, uh, uh, I think we have to you know, give the new government um, a little bit of time mm -hmm. uh, to spell out over the next few weeks exactly how um, uh, the opportunity zones will work um, and also, again, the, the strengthening of local institutions that um, uh, we believed in. I know Simon Clark believes in, so I expect that we can see you know, people like Ben Hutchin and Andy Street mm -hmm. um, and indeed others being given the tools they need to help to transform their local communities. So long answer, for which I apologize, but I, I'm, I'm trying to be both self-critical about where we weren't as effective as we should have been in making the argument mm -hmm. and also optimistic about the potential for the new government to take forward a lot of what we were trying to do. Is there anything that you uh, wished you'd had longer to focus on? Any unfinished business from the Living Up Department? You... Oh, yes, there are lots. And, um, and I think the, the, the key thing is that what we, the prospectus that we laid out in the white paper was going to take a lot of time mm -hmm. to implement. And as I say, you know, the government has a, an opportunity now to put um, uh, more uh, energy and imagination behind some of the ideas that we, we put forward. I think some of the other areas, though, where we um, were beginning to make progress, and again, you know, let's see, um, in that department, one of the areas over which we had a direct lever was housing policy. Mm -hmm. um, the government has shown, in what it said so far, a welcome level of ambition on that. Um, one of the questions there will be, can we make sure that we have effective urban regeneration? Mm -hmm. That you can't, again, 
that will be driven by the private sector, but there's a role for government, for uh, the Department and for Homes England in making sure that brownfield sites are the right places in which to invest. Um, and then the second thing is, if we're thinking about the housing market overall, it is a natural conservative desire, which I wholeheartedly endorse, to make sure that we can get um, and extend home ownership. And it was an area where Boris's Prime Minister was, was incredibly keen. But we also recognise that um, you have a significant number of people, particularly younger people, who are living in rented accommodation. Mm -hmm. And we need to show that we've got a conservative answer for everyone at every stage on the housing ladder. And we understand the pressure that people in the private rented sector face. Mm -hmm. And we also understand that uh, social housing, while um, we want to, to help people to move on from it when appropriate, also needs to be in a fit and decent state. Um, and again, I think that thinking about the department overall, I do hope that uh, there's a recognition that the work that um, my friend Eddie Hughes did mm. on renters reform is carried forward um, and that the social housing bill that Eddie introduced as well mm. is given full effect. Yeah, yeah. It does, it does feel to me like we've, on, on housing specifically, we have had a target to yes. deliver 300,000 homes mm. for a long time now. Mm. And uh, we have not yet met. We've been yep. getting kind of incrementally yeah, no, 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 closer yes. to it, but, yes. it um, oh. but never um, yes. uh, got close to it, at least not since um, the days of Macmillan. And yes. um, I just wonder, are there, well, mm. you inherited Robert Jenrick's planning reforms yes. um, and mm. uh, remodeled them into a package that mm. you believe could get through yes. Parliament. The government is clearly revisiting mm. the planning question. Yeah. Is there any advice you would be giving to the government about how to consider that question yes. in order to meet that target and deliver the homes that Britain needs? Yes. I think that the, the, the high-level argument that we need more homes is uh, uh, widely accepted. Yep. And the, the fact that our planning system is not working, people understand. But there is significant resistance to new development in, in large parts of the country. And I think in order to... To win the argument, you need to meet people where they are. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we ran through a range of, of issues that we felt were um, the perfectly legitimate and understandable concerns that people had about new development. Um, people were worried about uh, uh, the aesthetic and you know, broader quality of new housing. Yep. So you know about the uh, economics of house building. You know that the biggest cost is land. There are some of the big volume developers who were essentially manipulating the land market and then building homes that were not high quality and which were identical and which um, local people didn't feel was going to enhance their, mm -hmm. you know, their, their community. Infrastructure is another big one, perfectly legitimate to say, well, I'm prepared to welcome new homes, but that means it's going to be more difficult for me to get a GP appointment, more difficult to get my child into the primary school I want, and so on. So you have to have an answer on infrastructure. One of the big problems that Rob Jenrick had is that um, the proposals that he put forward were interpreted as somehow robbing people of democratic control. Mm -hmm. You've got to make sure that democratic voice is there. So, again, and the government has said that when it talks about enterprise zones, they yep. need to be bought into, not imposed. Yep. The other thing is the environment. I mean, I don't want to be um, uh, too starry-eyed about it, but I do think that uh, there is a legitimate and genuine concern about the environmental consequences of house building um, that do need to be addressed. Not just building homes that are energy efficient, mm -hmm. important though that is, but just making sure that if you lose valuable natural green space that you mm. invent in, invest in environmental gain elsewhere. Mm. And then the final thing is, which is more sort of inchoate, but I think can be captured, is that people object to the idea of dormitories being plonked on yep. to existing settlements. They want communities, they want new neighborhoods, they want walkability and so on. Um, and again, the very best developers and landowners recognize that. Um, you know, and and uh, uh, the king, mm. um, when he created communities like Poundbury and Nan Sledden, completely understood that. Mm -hmm. You've got a new development, not that new now, but a new development like Poundbury. I know there'll be some people who hate its aesthetic and so on. I love it, but perfectly legitimate to have all alternative views. But the really striking thing about Poundbury is the development was welcomed. Homes there are now worth more than homes in Dorchester, the original community. If you visit it, it is a community. You can't tell the difference between the uh, homes that are owned and the homes that are rented. So it's got that, that proper sense. Mm. Um, some people might find it romantic, but I think that's what we want of um, you know, a, a, a place with which people can identify. Mm -hmm. um, so if you take all of those points on board, I think you can build quite rapidly a coalition mm -hmm. for, uh, uh, for planning reform. Um, and for, uh, for um, uh, the new homes that we need. And then the final thing, which I touched on earlier, is 
uh, I think any government needs to show that it is doing everything possible to ensure that there can be building on brownfield sites. But building on brownfield sites is always difficult because mm -hmm. they're often small, disaggregated, and it costs a lot of money to turn them into the sorts of sites onto which you can build homes to deal with the, you know, the effects of what might have been a previously industrial site and so on. So that's where you need the, the public sector to take a little bit of the strain, yeah. assemble the sites, remediate, and then get the private sector in to build. So my final question before I open up to questions from yeah. the floor is, is just an, an observation and a question. So having kind of witnessed you in, your, in a number of roles mm. in the cabinet, you've always struck me as a cabinet minister or, or an, uh, a kind of minister with a method mm. that, you, that you approach when you, when you kind of take on a new cabinet brief, you approach it with a very specific mm. process of, kind of reading engagement mm -hmm. and, then, uh, and then typically uh, undertaking a, quite a radical program of reform in, in basically every department you've been in. Could you talk through uh, some of the way you approach yes. a new brief yes. and perhaps offer any advice well, to your successors or your, your, the new cabinet as yes. they now? Well, everyone will have a different approach. So um, what worked for me, and again, there are lots of things I've got wrong and there are lots of things that I argued for that people can legitimately profoundly disagree with, but what works for me may not work for others, but insofar as it, it, the, 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 there's anything. I think the first thing is, if you're going to change any aspect of public policy, um, you have to recognize that you're dealing with a system. Mm -hmm. So you've got to understand how all of the interlocking parts of the system work. So at education, uh, uh, it is not enough just, you know, David Cameron made this point, uh, it's both structures and standards. Again, that was a deliberate simplification, um, but the, the point he was making, which I, I think is right, is that firstly, when we were introducing or extending academization and introducing free schools, we were making what I thought was an important point about autonomy and heads being captains of their ship um, and a greater degree of latitude being given to them to do what they thought was right. Mm. Um, and also having uh, proof points so that you could say, well, within this local authority, mm. with very similar intakes, this school is doing better than that. So improvement is not impossible. Yep. Um, and. Uh, it's not like we're asking you to compare your performance with that of a school which is very generously funded in a leafy area. Mm -hmm. So there, there were, you know, structural changes there. But then you also need to, at the same time, make sure that everything from inspection to uh, qualifications to uh, the quality of teachers to the incentives for teachers to work in different schools are dealt with as well. Similarly, on the environment, uh, you know, the single overarching uh, uh, thing, which of course many people have focused on quite rightly, is global warming and carbon mm. um, uh, reduction. That's a critical part of it. But you've got to look at every other part of the environment. Why are farmers incentivized to do what they do? Um, uh, uh, why is it water companies are regulated in the way that they are? Um, what are the other measures of, of, of health? You know, the, the environment is a, is a vital system. Blood pressure matters when you've got a patient in. It's one of the most important things. But that's not the only thing if you're going to determine whether or not a patient is healthy. So look at things in a system. And, you know, the same thing can apply, as we just discussed, to housing and levelling up. The same thing applies to welfare and the incentives for people to go into work mm -hmm. and so on. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, the two other things that I would say are... Um, uh, Look at the incentives in a system. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I have a friend, Paul Marshall, a uh, uh, very successful businessman. Uh, he, his mantra, which I think is right, is show me the incentives and I will show you the behavior. There are lots of idealistic people who really want to do the right thing in public service and elsewhere. But if the incentives in a system are skewed, mm -hmm. then you won't get the results that you want. And again, uh, Julian Legrand, uh, you know, the, the sort of king of uh, public sector reform uh, uh, theory over the last 30 years, makes this point very well. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and he talks about um, knights and pawns and uh, uh, the way in which uh, uh, the knightly or chivalric um, uh, impulse in public service is a wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. But if people within public services regard themselves as pawns, uh, if they don't have agency and control, and if you also don't look at the broader incentives to do the right thing, then the system won't work as well as it, uh, it should. Mm -hmm. um, and then the final thing that I would say is um, uh, another phrase which has been used, pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will, mm -hmm. but in plain English, uh, 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 hope for the best but plan for the worst. That you've got to uh, imagine 
that things might go wrong in that area. You've got to believe that you can succeed, but you've got to have a proper understanding mm. of what uh, risk involves and where you might go wrong. Mm. Um, and that, I think, is a, a properly conservative thing. You know, we, we all recognize that at times you need audacity and daring in politics. And, you know, to take a case in point, there are a few more audacious and daring politicians than Boris Johnson. But also, to Boris's great credit, during the COVID pandemic, he wanted to know what is the absolute worst we're going to face. Mm -hmm. At mm -hmm. certain points, he would say, right, I'm prepared to, uh, uh, you know, my budget for risk has gone up here. Mm -hmm. But he never wanted the most optimistic scenario. He wasn't um, in the space of saying everything will go mm -hmm. as sweetly and beautifully and we needn't worry. Um, and I think so those are the three things. Um, if you're going to change things, look at the whole system. Uh, always look at incentives and be clear-eyed about uh, the, the reasons why people act as they do, notwithstanding the fact that there'll be a nobility of motive there as well. And then the third thing is uh, have a proper conservative sense of how things can go wrong, mm -hmm. as well as a proper reformist aspiration to try to, to, to get through. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, that's a nice and potentially quite timely given uh, the last few weeks uh, mm -hmm. note to end that part of the conversation on. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to take three questions at a time. I'm going to take uh, the lady there, the gentleman here, and then the gentleman in the front row. Mm -hmm. so. yes. um, hi, good afternoon. My name's Anna Cuban. I'm a borough councillor in Basingstoke. I've always had huge regard for you, but I have to say that I'm extremely unhappy with how unsettling uh, your comments are to our party at the moment. And I'd like you to answer me two things. Firstly, how is it that after 12 years under a Tory government, we have the highest tax burden in the last 70 years? And how is it that you can accuse the uh, new Chancellor's Exchequer of uh, the uh, market disarray when the dollar rate has gone up 6.7% and the sterling is directly related to the dollar rate and the reality is that the market disarray and the rising interest rates is directly as a result of the Fed. And I don't think it's fair for you to be causing this as a very senior statesman at such a very serious and grave time in our country's history. I'd like your views on the zero rate and on the tax burden. Thank you. Thank you very much. Michael, are you okay to take a number yeah, of questions? Yeah, of course. Sure. Yes, been here. Uh, Johnson, Cuba, I'm concerned that there isn't uh, any emphasis on the position of the, de uh, the, the balance of payments and our trade deficit. This has been going on for so many years, and it is the result of a, an input into the, the fact that we have a weak pound. And what I don't quite understand is why they're not saying we need to bring back jobs to the start abroad now that should be a more he highly mechanised than when they perhaps went abroad, so that we can actually try to build, our, to, to, to eliminate this balance of payment deficit. We, we have a net, we had a, a, a net assets overseas, but now that's all gone. So we are in a very precarious situation as well as I can see. Thank so you. Thank you very much. Right. Um, I just wondered, you've probably seen the polls in the last few days. I wondered if you thought the actions in the budget and the trust of government made a Conservative election victory less likely. Thank you. Uh, sorry, I didn't catch your name. Or, and are, are you a... Um, I'm from the Mirror. Oh, thank <laughs> you. No, 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 no. Great newspaper. Um, so, Only, thank you for what you said. And I think there are two very important points. The first thing is about the tax burden. Um, um, taxes are in the position that we find them, not as a direct result of... Uh, of choice or desire or ideological conviction that high taxes are a good thing. Neither Boris nor Rishi uh, are high tax social democrats. Um, both, and indeed the cabinet that Boris led and of which I was part and of where Rishi was chancellor, were dealing with the consequences of the COVID pandemic. Uh, I won't get into now, but people might want to argue about what the government did during the COVID pandemic. Was it right or was it wrong in dealing with it? But there was a scale of intervention which I think was right. Uh, 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 furlough, support for people at a very difficult time in order to make sure they could maintain their jobs. That had to be paid for. 
Uh, again, I think it's a perfectly <coughs> legitimate uh, discussion about the best means of doing so. But uh, when we have a, uh, a backlog in the National Health Service at the level that we do, when we have, as Boris quite rightly pointed out, a need to address uh, our social care system in order to ensure that people can leave hospital and be in care in order to ensure that the NHS can concentrate on those most acutely in need, then additional investment for the NHS of the kind that national insurance contribution rise was designed to secure seems to me to be a perfectly prudent way to proceed. And uh, again, if we look at you know, other uh, uh, jurisdictions, other countries that have faced the same challenges as we have, they recognize the vital important need to ensure that uh, the balance between tax and spending is one that commands the confidence of the markets. And that takes me on to uh, the second point that you make. Overall, in the amount that um, uh, Liz and Kwanzi announced that we would additionally be borrowing in the mini budget um, uh, of uh, seven days ago, nine days ago, about 35% of that was for tax cuts. Conservatives traditionally cut taxes when uh, we have uh, a budget surplus. That is what uh, Nigel Lawson did in 1988. Uh, the markets took a particular view, and there were a variety of factors that led them to take that view. But I think that there is inherent risk, if you were a conservative, in saying that you can borrow and borrow and borrow. This risk might pay off, but I am concerned by what it says about the, the core conservative message of prudence, and the second concern that I have is that if we are to cut taxes, and I touched on it earlier, and, and there is a case, a very good case, very respectable case, for relieving the burden on some, then it should not be people who are um, already wealthy. Millionaires will, will gain by tens of thousands of pounds as a result of these tax cuts. Um, and people on average and below average incomes will not. Um, and that, I think, is the wrong priority. Now, there are other factors that we could go into, but I think we have an opportunity, every government has an opportunity, uh, to review when the information comes in, the course on which it's set. There are lots of good things um, from changes to IR35 to enterprise zones in the financial statement, uh, in the fiscal event, um, but... Um, my disquiet uh, reflects some of the things that I said during the leadership election, and uh, I think it is important that the case for conservatism is made, and conservatives, I believe, should be prudent when dealing with uh, 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 the nation's finances, particularly at a challenging point like this. If I'm proven wrong, then uh, uh, Liz will not only have grown the pie, she will also have ensured that there is a massive humble pie, which I will have to eat. Um, uh, on the point about balance of payments, um, yes, you're absolutely right. Work done by Onward, arguments made in the Daily Telegraph by uh, my friend Nick Timothy have made precisely this point. Um, we have relied for a long time in the United Kingdom on uh, what Mark Carney called the kindness of strangers. Um, uh, in order to fund our economic model, we need to maintain uh, international confidence, and that is one of the inevitable risks if we are seen to be taking steps that put that confidence at risk. Um, there's a very good piece in uh, The Sunny Times Today by Ed Conway that runs through precisely that argument. Ed makes the point, of course, that there have been other administrations that have been able to course correct um, and then go on to economic and indeed political success as a result of that. Um, but there are fundamental challenges in our economy, fundamental challenges of productivity, which again, to be fair, everything that Liz and Kwasi and other ministers have said so far uh, demonstrates that they absolutely understand. Now, improving productivity, I believe, uh, uh, requires lots of tools, but 
recognizing that we need to improve it and that we also need to have a more balanced economy overall, absolutely right. Um, and um, my view is that um, the most important thing at the moment is to uh, do the right thing for the country. Um, uh, I think it was Tony Blair, and I hope this doesn't discredit the phrase, who said, uh, the best policy is the best politics. And again, uh, uh, I thought Liz was right when she was being interviewed earlier today to say, let's not talk about the optics. Let's talk about, not talk about how things are perceived. Let's do the right thing. Um, and I think that those are the, uh, you know, the, uh, the principles, the instincts by which um, uh, politicians and prime ministers should steer. Fantastic. Uh, I'm going to take a question here from Jerry, a gentleman here, and then the gentleman behind. Uh, I know I, we should, we've got time, so we should yeah. get most people in. Jerry. Thanks. Uh, Jerry Scott from the Times. Um, I want to ask you about fracking. What do you think about the lifting of the ban? And with your views on local decision making, devolution, what you were just talking about, oh. about meeting people where they were, what would local consent look like to you? Because the government hasn't been able to describe what that would be so far for, lo for fracking to go ahead. They're very good questions, and uh, I'm not uh, equipped yet to answer them because we don't have all the information in front of us. So um, Jacob has outlined that he wants to look at the, the you know, some of the, uh, the science and the, uh, the geological thresholds around uh, fracking. Um, and I can completely understand why he wishes to do so. I can completely understand why, uh, for all the obvious reasons, we would want to increase the supply of domestic energy, move towards a greater position of energy security, and so on. Um, uh, what local consent would look like, uh, again, uh, there's work still to be done, or rather there, there is more detail to be provided publicly um, uh, on that. Um, and, you know, again, I wait to see. I think it is uh, important for all of us, wherever possible, to recognise that the government has uh, a formidable set of, you know, global challenges to face, and therefore, I, uh, I wouldn't want to, uh, unless and until decisions are made, second guess or anticipate those. So I think you know it's it's, uh, it, it it could be an important part of the equation, but let's wait and see. There's more work that needs to be made public. Sorry, I, I jumped the gun and we should take them no, three. No, no, not at all. Not at all. Uh -huh. um, so gentleman here, gentleman behind, and I should, I'll take you as well if that's okay. Mm -hmm. so, yep. Hi, Mr. Gave. I'm uh, Rob Parker from Northern Agenda Editor for Reach, so I work about politics in the Mill Box. Um, can I ask you about child poverty, which I guess is an issue which kind of uh, hints at your uh, two areas that you've covered during your career. Uh, in country at large, child poverty rates have been going down mm. in recent years, but the exception to that is the North East, where they've actually been going up, and they have been for quite a few years. What do you think the reason for that is? And do you think uh, the policies of the current government will help uh, address that? Gentleman behind. Michael, thank you very much. Um, my question relates to the work you do with young people in this country. And if you talk to young people, there is great disillusionment in terms of um, uh, education loans, in terms of housing level, and in terms of jobs. And we have not had a ministry of youth here, which some countries have had, and those deal with, um, with um, issues. Then when we come to jobs, um, we're not really preparing the young for the jobs of tomorrow. We're still preparing them for the jobs of today. Uh, because we haven't got a Silicon Valley culture here, how do we change that so that the young feel um, involved, enabled, empowered, and helpless? OK, I'm going to take one more, I think. Did you have a question? Yep. Hi, I'm Alex Watts from the firm Sky News. Um, you spoke a lot about how um, government should look at the whole picture and not just the little parts of it. Do you think that um, the current government is not looking at the whole picture? Um, firstly, thank you. Um, on child poverty, um, uh, I'll be honest, I don't know enough about why the North East is an outlier. Um, uh, and it would be wrong for me to speculate without um, looking at the detail. Now, that there are... Um, uh, as you both know, there are historic challenges that the Northeast has faced, 
they're not unique to the Northeast, but they're more uh, pronounced there in terms of deindustrialization um, and uh, also in terms of the variable quality of, of education in different parts of the Northeast. Those are just two factors. I wouldn't want to stray beyond that without looking at it, but I think it is very important um, that um, when we're building up a picture of what requires to be done to address child poverty and to address opportunity more broadly, that we've got the most granular sense of it. Um, and one of the things, again, I hope you won't regard this as a distraction, one of the things that we were trying to do in the Department for Leveling Up was to look at the specific factors as well as the common factors uh, affecting areas that had fallen behind. So in uh, Blackpool and in Grimsby, in Blackpool particularly, there are real problems with the housing market there and real problems with the welfare system there that mean that the other challenges that you have in, um, in Blackpool are exacerbated. Similarly in Grimsby, uh, you have some very good schools, but the quality of education overall uh, is lower than it should be and the sense of civic pride, which is strong, is not reflected in the local political institutions. Um, I mean, I am optimistic about the future of the Northeast more broadly because I think uh, what Ben Hatchin is doing in Tees Valley is incredibly impressive. And I think in Newcastle, you have uh, uh, one of Britain's strongest universities with a clear commitment, particularly in life sciences, to uh, the future. So um, I, 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 I think that. Um, uh, the future can be very bright for the Northeast, but I think what is required, I'm sure this is going on even now, is a proper granular understanding. And uh, Simon Clark, who I referenced earlier, is uh, you know, one of the brightest people I've met in politics. And I think that um, uh, if you want someone in a position of political leadership to tackle those challenges, he's the best. Um, on, on the point about, um, about young people, I think you're right to, uh, absolutely right, to bundle together a series of uh, challenges and you know one of the, the points has been made by my friend David Wilkes long before um, uh, in, in, in our broader political conversation is generational unfairness um, and uh, the point you make about student finance the point you make about housing is a is a powerful one um, and and again it's about looking at things systematically so the changes that we made to student finance have meant that higher education is a more financially sustainable footing in this country than than in many many others and it's extended the range of people who can go to university. But it has also meant that some people have been persuaded to take on some courses and a level of debt that may not necessarily be in their long-term best interests. The housing uh, uh, market, as we've been discussing, hasn't worked in favor of young people for some time. The idea of a specific Ministry of Youth, I'm cautious about because I think when you create ministries which are thematic rather than dealing with you know, policy areas like the environment or like education, there is a danger that uh, other government departments only pay lip service to them. Um, but I think that um, there is a case for saying, again, self-critically, that when I arrived at the Department for Education and we moved from the, the Department for Children, Schools and Families to Education, we were right to focus on the transformation of schools, but we should have paid even more attention to some of the other areas that support education. Um, and then the final thing on the jobs of uh, tomorrow, it is difficult to predict what the jobs of tomorrow will be because there are some jobs that exist now that we could never have anticipated 20 years ago. But the skills of tomorrow, I think you're absolutely right to focus on. And some of that rests on making sure that there is a firm foundation in the sorts of skills that you can take anywhere. And one of the areas where I think, uh, uh, one of the many areas where I think the Prime Minister's track record, so she absolutely gets it, is the focus on science, technology, so, yes, science, technology, engineering and mathematics that she showed when she was at the Department of Education. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm not one of those people who believes that the future is all in STEM, but certainly we needed to orient our education system more in favour of it. Liz was at the heart of that, and I think that's you know, more work that requires to be done. Um, on the, looking at things in a systematic way, I think the government is looking at things in a systematic way. So, Again, the eight areas that have been identified as areas where supply-side reform is required and productivity can be improved, um, I think are spot on. The question will be, inevitably, can we marry the scale of radicalism required in order to um, improve productivity in those areas with the time available um, and with the political constraints that um, uh, inevitably exist? But I think uh, Liz and team are quite right to look at uh, the housing market, land use planning, uh, agriculture, uh, broadband, uh, and so on, uh, childcare and education, 
as areas where more can be done. I think that's absolutely right. Fantastic. Um, we've got quite a few more hands up. I'm going to take Aubrey at the front, Quentin, and then Frank at the back, and then I will try and bring some of the others in. So Aubrey first. Hey, good afternoon, Mr. Gabe. Aubrey Allegretti from The Guardian. Mm. I just wanted to pick up on the point you were making about tax cuts and I suppose the practicality yes. of this debate in Parliament, mm. uh, because the Prime Minister and the Chancellor seem to be pretty unbowed, mm. pushing ahead with obviously abolishing the 45p rate and the cap on bankers' bonuses. They don't seem to be in the mood for compromises or new terms, <coughs> as you're sort of calling for. And some Conservative MPs are suggesting they won't vote for such measures. So do you think that the government will blink, seeing the scale of concern, and eventually decide that actually it's in the best interest to you turn? And if not, then what do you make of past chair Jake Berry saying that those who oppose these measures in a vote will lose the vote? That's so question one. Quentin. Uh, Michael, That's now that you're in trouble making mode, um, <laughs> two questions. <laughs> How much of a nuisance are, are the French? And the second question, <laughs> to decide any naked self-interest, should the House of Lords be scrapped? <laughs> Very good. We are ranging broadly in this conversation. Frank. <laughs> you for speaking up or are you allowed to survive and thrive as an independent voice? Very good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> great, great. Um, thank you. Um, so Aubrey, um, very good question. News editors of The Guardian will be proud of you. Um, thank you so much. The uh, first thing I was going to say is I'm not very good at making predictions. Um, uh, I once wrote a book called Michael Petulli, The Future of the Right, rather than <laughs> Michael Petulli, The Future of Evening Radio. Um, and, uh, and therefore, I, I work, you know, everything you've laid out, absolutely you know, quite right, but I, I'm not the person to make those predictions and so on. Other, 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 other people will, so sorry to dodge that. Um, uh, Quentin asks, now that I'm in troublemaking mode, um, Quentin should know that I've been in troublemaking mode ever since I started out as a journalist on the Peterborough column of the Daily Telegraph. Uh, many years ago. Um, but but on, on his two questions, um, uh, I think that um, uh, the French are the French are the French, um, and uh, we, uh, we need to have the best possible relationship with all our neighbours, and it will always be the case that a French president or a French prime minister will operate in their national interest, as a British prime minister should operate in our national interest. Uh, but there are times when we can, uh, lots of times when we can cooperate fruitfully, um, and I think that actually, um, I'll, I'll break my rule and I will make a prediction, I think that Emmanuel Macron and Liz Truss will get on far better than many people have uh, imagined because they're both strong characters with a clear view and a proper understanding of the need for toughness in diplomacy, uh, but also the need for pragmatism when it comes to deal-making. On the House of Lords and scrapping it, um, uh, no. <laughs> um, the... Um, uh, when uh, the French philosopher Voltaire was on his deathbed, uh, he was asked by the uh, priest who was administering extreme unction, um, do you reject the devil and all his works? And Voltaire said, this is no time to make new enemies. Um, and that's, rather, <laughs> that's rather how I feel. Um, and, um, and, um, and, and Frank, I don't know. I mean, the, the, you, you, it's very kind of you to say that. Um, and, uh, and I think that, you know, the, the thing is, um, I can entirely understand, you know, with Reverend Donnelly uh, earlier, that, you know, the point about um, uh, wanting everyone to work together. And I do want, uh, uh, you know, the uh, Conservatives to win the next election, and I want Liz to be a success, and I, uh, I'm very worried about the consequences of a Labour victory at the, at the next election. Uh, I think that we've got a, a, a little bit of time to reflect on... Uh, uh, the challenges ahead. Uh, I've outlined two particular concerns, uh, and I hope that we can see those addressed. Um, uh, but as I hope I've indicated in some of the other things that I've said, uh, I'm hopeful about a lot of what Liz has outlined and what the government can do. But I do think that there are, you know, the risk of repeating myself, there are, there, there are those two worries. Conservatives have a reputation for being prudent and careful. 
Sometimes audacity is required, but if we lose our reputation for prudence and care, then that opens the door to a left-wing government being reckless in a way that we would all in this room think was a mistake. And then the second thing is, Conservatives have in the past been caricatured, I think, as a party speaking for the luckiest and most fortunate in our society. At its best, a case can be made for saying that uh, those with talent and those with zing generate the, uh, the changes, the enterprise that country needs. And I agree with Abraham Lincoln, you don't make uh, the uh, weak strong by making strong weak. Absolutely. But at the same time, we can't be a party. It's wrong if when we have a choice between how an additional pound will be spent, thinking that that pound should be spent giving tax cuts to the wealthiest when others are facing really tough times. And I think that the, the danger is that cutting taxes at the right time and in the right way, which I believe in 100%, we become more difficult as a result of the environment in which we now find ourselves. Fantastic. Um, we've got a few people who've been waiting. Uh, there's a gentleman at the back, uh, there's a woman next to him, and there's a gentleman at the front. So, you first. Thank you. Hello, Michael. I'm Jason Tisdall from Tangent Energy. We design and install solar and battery systems. Very interested in uh, the idea of all these new builds that will hopefully mm. come on a pace. Uh, my experience is that builders tend towards the bare minimum uh, in terms of the energy uh, levels that they build to. We really need them to use far less energy because these structures will be around for 50 or 100 yes. of years. It's vital that we change it now. What incentives could a government rapidly bring in that would really make that happen? Thank you very much, Julia. And Ollie. Uh, Ollie Cole from Times Radio. Um, we gave my poor Julia the skills of tomorrow. Um, the, uh, <laughs> uh, I want to bring you sort of full circle back to Will's last question about running a department. The first thing that this new Chancellor did was get rid of Tom Scholar from the Treasury. And earlier today, former PWP firm sec said that that would have sent shockwaves throughout the whole of the civil service and put everyone on the back foot in terms of giving frank and fair advice to ministers. You have always had a grip on departments. You've always managed to get the department on your side and work well with them. Is there a worry that government sort of grinds to a halt, butting heads with the civil service, rather than working with them and delivering? Um, thank you. So um, on uh, Jason's point, again, um, I think uh, I talked about the importance of systems and how complex things are. Um, and when we're thinking about energy, uh, we have to have systems thinking overall. So yes, we do need to look at what the incentives are in order to uh, build in energy efficiency to the homes of the future. And we also need to think about how we can uh, create the right market incentives for the uh, uh, even wider adoption of renewable energy. Um, uh, but the, the, the subject is so deserving of uh, detailed attention and so complex, and there are interrelations with you know, other factors as well. But I don't have an instant answer to it. Um, but I think you are asking the right questions there. You know, I know, that because of the UK's, the nature of the UK's housing stock, because um, it is older and, um, and, and uh, you know, what's the word, uh, leakier in energy terms than some comparable countries like Germany, there is, the, there is a a bigger challenge for us, um, and that's why designing the right incentives in the right way is, is going to matter. But uh, you know, we've got a lot of very smart people in Bayes who are looking at this, smart ministers who understand the importance of it. Um, my friend Graeme Stewart, you know, one of the smartest cookies in the Parliamentary Conservative Party, 
uh, I think we'll uh, be coming forward with some useful proposals in that area. But I, 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 I'd be out of my depth if I tried to sort of over-specify. On Juliet's broader point about concern, again, I think, um, I'm a big fan of the RSPB, but I, I think they may have jumped the gun a wee bit, um, because um, in all the conversations that I've had with the people who are at the heart of, 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 of the new government, they are committed to net zero, they are uh, nature lovers, they do want to do the right thing. Of course, when we're facing the uh, economic challenges that we are at the moment, there may be a case for, in the minds of some, going slower here or uh, thinking about a slightly uh, lower level of ambition there. Again, I think let's not rush to judgment. Let's see what the overall package is. It is entirely possible that in enterprise zones you can have a faster way of granting planning permission with a greater degree of certainty that in no way diminishes environmental protection. So I think, you know, I can completely understand the concerns, but I think let's just wait and see, because there are people who are in the government who are uh, absolutely <coughs> concerned about the environment as anyone in this room. And I think, in fact, Chris Kidmore, a long-time friend of this, has been specifically asked to look at uh, how we can uh, develop um, a proper net zero framework building on Quasi's work, I think that is a good sign. Um, on all these points, I wouldn't want to too personalise it because um, there will always be reasons why people will move on from particular roles at particular times. And uh, you've got to uh, have a, you know, a, a fit and a strong working relationship between uh, ministers and civil servants. In my experience, um, uh, civil servants are uh, uh, rarely inhibited from providing candid advice, and ministers welcome that. Uh, sometimes it is appropriate for a uh, uh, permanent secretary of a particular department to move on in order to refresh the team. Um, I never worked directly with Tom uh, Scholar, so I can't offer a particular uh, reflection on him. Everyone I know who work with him speaks very highly of him. Um, but I do think that the, um, if I think about the range of people who have been mentioned as his potential successors, all of them current permanent secretaries, you have a very strong cadre of public servants there available. So, you know, again, people will, will, will make their own view about, or take their own view about that particular judgment. But I don't think it, 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 it should be taken as anything other than just you know, a uh, uh, one event that doesn't portend a, a, a wider change in the way in which uh, ministers and civil servants can work together. Fantastic. I'm going to close with one final question. I'm going mm. to abuse the position of the chair and yeah. um, close with one final question to you, Michael, from me, which is um, which is about the kind of intellectual part mm. of conservatism. We yes. talked a little bit today yes. about what is conservatism mm. and what it isn't. Um, and obviously we are now 12 mm. years into a Conservative government. Yes. There are some people who mm. are clearly predicting that we may be on the cusp mm. of, a, of a change of government. Um, and you have been part of several successive yes. kind of intellectual renewal processes mm -hmm. within the Conservative Party. Mm -hmm. First as Chairman of Policy mm. Exchange, um, uh, then uh, under David Cameron's leadership and, and actually following mm. the Brexit vote actually uh, mm. under both um, well, Theresa and, and Boris mm. and that whole process of renewal. How confident are you that the Conservative Party can renew itself from this point for the kind of fourth per, per, uh, successive mm. uh, um, time in government, which mm. is clearly much harder because you're dealing with the day-to-day. -day. Mm. Um, how, yeah, how confident are you about Conservatism's ability to renew? I am confident because I think that um, uh, there, are, uh, th there is a, a degree of intellectual energy on mm -hmm. the broad centre-right, um, that I don't detect in the same way on the centre-left. Um, and I'm not trying to make a party political point, but I think it is true that if you look at um, what's happening uh, with the work Ombuds doing, what's happening with the work policy exchange is doing, what's happening with the CPS, what's happening also with the IEA, ASI, TPA, and others, reform, um, you've got a spectrum. <coughs> um, now, there, there are distinguished thinkers on the left, but even there, some of the very distinguished some of those are people who are drawn towards arguments on the right. So if you look at uh, people like uh, Morris Glassman or mm. Jonathan Rutherford or Adrian Pabst, they're all very interesting thinkers on the left. 
mm -hmm. who are arguing that there is a lot in the conservative tradition that is right for our time. Um, I think that uh, the danger is if, even as we recognize that the single most important area at the moment is economics, if, if we think that the conservative tradition is all about economics, and in particular if we think of it, it's all about um, a particular uh, tradition of uh, economic liberal thinking, then we risk being pulled ever so gently off course. So um, I know, Will, that you and Nick Timothy have produced a new weekly e-newsletter, oh, yeah. The Conservative yeah. Reader, and in it, um, one of the books that you recently recommended is The Quest for Community, mm -hmm. um, which I would urge on everyone here. I think that um, it, you know, it is important that the, the, the depth of conservative thinking is reflected. And, and you know, one thing I would say is that um, there's a new book out by um, uh, an American-born thinker, Yoram Hazoni, called Conservatism and Anglo-American Tradition. Uh, and I don't agree with everything that he argues for or he says, but one of the points he makes is that, you know, there was a big debate going on uh, in the immediate aftermath of the American Revolution between the Jeffersonians and the Hamiltonians. And it was not a debate between left and right. It was a debate between essentially two versions of centre-right thinking. Um, and uh, I am in that debate a Hamiltonian, not just because he has the better songs in the musical, <laughs> <laughs> but because I think it's important to think about the health of a national community um, and I think in the same way, you know, there, 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 there can be a fruitful debate um, uh, on the centre right, and it's important that we're respectful uh, towards different traditions within it. Um, and I think that, you know, the fact that uh, you, I know, have had lots of people from universities and in their twenties signing up to your e newsletter suggests that there is an appetite, a thirst for ideas mm -hmm. in politics. And the conservative tradition, I think, is in as strong a position to nourish that as any. Very good. Well, that's an optimistic note on which to end. Thank you all so much uh, for giving up your time for your brilliant questions. Thank you, Michael, for being so <laughs> frank. in your answers um, and uh, and if I could just uh, leave you with one final note Onward is uh, in here in this room in two hours time for a similar event um, in conversation with Tom Tugendhat uh, which uh, you were all warmly invited to and we are in the Birmingham Library for the rest of the conference uh, where we have a packed schedule of panel events so um, please do grab one of our leaflets outside um, see some of our events and uh, I hope to see you all uh, over the coming days but thank you all for giving up your time